Yeah, welcome to my talk. Um, my name is Matthias, uh, but I go by Maffintosh on all the networks, um, except for that, where I have a public key instead. <coughs> um, I'm from uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, which is just like a little bit to the north here, so if you're ever around, come say hi. Love to hang out. Just got so many new wires here. Oh, it's fine. So I stand here. Um, <coughs> yeah, so if you don't know me, I like to go by, you know, that protocol lead, which basically means kind of like was what Paolo was saying. I, I do most of the technical stuff in that and try to have a lot of opinions about the protocol direction and, and influence that and, and make a lot of decisions about that. So I really enjoy doing that. I'm hoping everybody in here has heard of that before, or like most people, right? I see some, I see most people doing this. That's good. Uh, otherwise, I mean, you must uh, have lost a lot of false target anyways. Yeah, so that's awesome. Um, I'll try not to make my talk too long because it is very techno babbly, so don't want to bore anybody too much. Uh, so anyways, cool. I thought I would just do like a, a talk that's like basically the status of that uh, from a technical point of view because I'm technical and also just like try to explain some of the technical components and where we're going and what we're working on because that's basically the questions I get all the time. So it's nice to have a forum of like-minded people and try to explain some of that. So, you know, when I was sitting down doing this, I was like, I'll, I'll, draw, I'll make a drawing. This is the level of creativity we're gonna see in my talk, by the way. Because <laughs> um, <coughs> it's, and everybody can see this, right? I was sitting in the back before the contrast was a little bit off, but I think that's okay, cool, awesome. So basically, you know, when I talk about that, uh, from a technical point of view, we have like this box, where it's like, there's a dead CLI and like some dead JS modules, a bunch of dead modules and a desktop app. And that's in this box that's like, depending on these other things, uh, there's like a box called other, which is things I don't really care about for this talks. So like a ton of, depending on a ton of stuff. Somebody told me earlier that that used to be the module on NPM that depended on those things. So that was pretty cool. I thought that was like good achievement. Uh, but other than that, it depends on these things called um, hyperdrive, which I'm going to talk about. about. Uh, which depends on something called hypercore. And then we have a thing over here, it's called discovery, basically like uh, network stuff and stuff, a bunch of stuff like that. So um, this stack here, this bottom of this stack, is what I like to call like the hyper uh, star stack, like asteric, because they all start with hyper. And that's the thing I work mostly with um, <coughs> on my day-to-day -day stuff. For the talk, talk today, we're basically just gonna talk about these components, hyperdrive and hypercore, and you know, where they are, and where they're going, um, because that's what's closest to my heart right now. Um, so some cool things. We actually have a, a core team now working on these components. Uh, we had a crazy history with a bunch of pivots and people coming and people going and uh, funding coming and no funding and a like, ton of funding. And so now we're actually at a stage where we have uh, five people on there, more or less full-time everybody, and everybody's getting paid uh, to work on this, so that's awesome. It's a very exciting moment for us. Um, I just decided to put the GitHub handles on here on all the core team members. Uh, if you consider yourself a core team member and I miss you, just, I mean, this is just technical people, so just, I'll add you. It's not, it's open for everybody. Uh, we've got Andrew, Andrew's here, we've got me, we got uh, Paul Frace, who's down there, we got Emil, who's sitting down here, and uh, uh, David, who just started helping out with some of the discovery stuff, uh, who's somewhere else, but is also doing a ton of different stuff. So it's a really awesome team, really, really happy and excited about that. I'll just keep track of time also. Right, so I'm gonna start, uh, start talking about a little bit about the technical stuff. Um, I'll start here with talking about hypercore because that's gonna be the, by far the most boring part of this conversation. I'll just get that out of the way. So basically, if you don't know hypercore, it's in the dead stack. It's, it's the lowest level um, distributed component we have. It's basically the thing we build everything on top. Uh, and it's what we call our core distributed append only log. Um, if you don't know what an append only log is, I made this little drawing that's basically like a thing that you can just append to. So that kind of like, it's like a list, you know, like an array, it just, just keeps growing. So it's very easy to append to and it's very easy to get items out of. That's it. Um, and that's what hypercore is to us. Uh, it's a, a distributed version of that, which basically means that, you know, if you have a hypercore, you can very easily send it to somebody else and uh, they can send it to somebody else. Peer to peer, to peer. So. That's basically, you know, that's the level of our stack. Um, 
which you probably already, most people already uh, know about in here. Um, so some things we're working on in this stack that I'm very excited about is, uh, first of all, something called HSM support, which is like hardware secure modules. So I don't know if you, if you ever work with like um, cryptocurrencies and stuff like that, but a lot of them, instead of having all the keys for the things on your computers, you have these cool little you know, things in your keychain you can put in your computer and you can click to sign because then you don't have everything on your computer, which is pretty cool. Uh, we're working on support for that uh, for hypercores, which means that when you append data to them and you want to sign it, you can actually have these external keys, like having first class support for that. That's pretty awesome. Uh, kind of a little bit related to some of the DST stuff we heard earlier. Um, we spend a lot of time getting good noise support in the stack. Um, so for like, you know, when you talk to people, that you can do a, a <coughs> noise compliant handshake and encryption and exchange things. Uh, Emil has done a ton of work on that. It, it's in a really good shape. Um, and then we're doing some tweaks to the, to the wire protocol itself, where just, you know, some protocol updates that makes it a little bit more efficient and stable. So that when you talk to each other, it's just a little bit better, but not much. So that's, that's like basically, you know, where we're going with this. Other than that, it's, it's actually super stable uh, and it's been stable for a while now and we're really happy with it and it, it just works. If you don't think it works, you know, come punch me in the break or, or yell out. Uh, but that's my point of view. Um, so that's cool. So that's what I meant by it. It's boring. Um, so <coughs> I'd much more prefer to spend all the time talking about this component. So hyperdrive, uh, you probably heard Paul mention it a bunch of times. Um, if you haven't heard about it before, it's basically um, our file system abstraction. So it's like, you know, we have this append-only log, which is cool, but it's not very cool unless you have just a bunch of messages in line. In practice, you probably want to do something more interesting. So we build data structures on top of this. So Hyperdrive <coughs> is one of these uh, data structures. <coughs> Sorry. So basically, what we try to do in Hyperdrive is implement uh, POSIX, and I have a little asterisk there, I'll come back to you later. Uh, compliant file system, basically, you know, like everything you can do uh, with a POSIX file system, we want to be able to do with a, with a hyperdrive file system. Uh, and unlike uh, a lot of other uh, file sharing things, we're mostly just focused on real-time updates, which means that we're not super interested in just like adding a bunch of stuff, uh, making a static archive and sharing that. Uh, there's much, much better tools for that. We're more interested in like, you know, having something that evolves over time and it's versioned and you can write to. So like, you know, um, <coughs> think of like, you know, a recipe book, recipe book where you add a recipe every week and stuff like that, or every minute or every second, if you have a lot of recipes. Uh, that's something, you know, um, Hyperdrive is really good at and it's basically built for. <coughs> so uh, again, if you don't know this yet, it's basically implemented by uh, it uses this two hypercore design um, that I don't, I think last DTN, when was last DTN? 15, yeah, we didn't have any of this in 15. I was here, I actually spoke there in 15. We started babbling in some of this. Uh, so this is all new from then. Uh, but back then, the dead project still existed, but we were playing around with other stuff. Anyways, that was just a side note. Currently, it uses like this two hypercore design where um, you have one append-only log that we call a, a metadata hypercore, and then you have another append-only log that we call the content hypercore. And the difference between these two is that you have a, a metadata one where you basically want to you just write down all the files you have in your file system. <coughs> and in the content one, you write down, surprise, the content of the files. Like, so, you know, if you have a gigabyte file, you don't want to write that in the metadata, you want to write it in the content. Um, so it looks a little bit like this where, you know, the first entry of your append-only log is just like a header um, with a link to the content, like a, a link to another um, uh, hypercore that has your content. And then you just write like, oh, the first file I wrote was foo.txt. <coughs> it has a pointer to the content, zero. That means it started zero and it has 10 blocks of content and a bunch of other metadata, kind of like, you know, all the POSIX uh, data. And then at the end of this, we have this um, opaque data structure. I here just wrote a, called a, a lookup tree index, which is basically some metadata. I'll get back to that in a second. And then, you know, when you write a new file, you just append to this. And you, when you delete a file, you write a delete, deletion to this uh, log also. So it's very simple, like a little notebook where you write down everything you do. And practice is actually a bunch more complicated than that because that little uh, lookup tree index 
is basically meant so that you can find uh, a file you're looking for without having to look at all the data in a distributed context. Because like, you know, imagine you had a metadata with you know, a gazillion files. It would kind of suck to have to look at all the gazillion files to, uh, to find one. Um, so, and it also suck if you had to download all of it first and then make an index and then find it really fast because that's not really fast. So it's actually just slower in, than looking at it once. So the idea is that we have this little embedded tree index that allows you to find the file you're looking for really fast by embedding some data that helps you. Uh, all secure and distributed without you having to trust anybody other than the original person. So that's all good. Um, um <coughs> So right now we are on uh, HyperCore 9, sorry, HyperDrive 9. Uh, we're working really heavily on um, uh, something called HyperCore 10, which is the next version. This is just node versions. They don't mean anything. They increment like every minute, but right now it's 10. Doesn't mean there's been 10 really cool things. It's probably been one cool thing and then a bunch of eh. Uh, but 10 is really cool. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about like, you know, what we're doing in 10 and all the problems we had with the previous one and so how we're fixing them in 10. <coughs> uh, so the pe main people working on this is basically Andrew, who's here, uh, and, uh, and me. But in practice, it's mostly Andrew uh, because I'm just like trying to coordinate it and like help with the stuff. But Andrew is doing all the, the nitty gritty, getting it to work and, and getting no credit for it. So he should get more credit. That's awesome. He's also paid to do it. So I don't know how much credit he should really get. <laughs> So <coughs> if you go to our uh, GitHub issues, there's a lot of people writing problems about this. So I thought I'd put that up. So this is the problem we've had in previous versions. I'm just gonna try to be very honest here and tell us what issues we had. And, um, I probably skipped a lot of issues. You wanna yell at me so you can also yell them out if you want. I'll tell you how we're fixing them. Basically right now we have, we've had this issue for a while where if you, if you have a hyperdrive or a dead and you write a ton of files into a folder, uh, it kind of slows down and becomes slow to use. Um, <coughs> so that's kind of sucky because, you know, a lot of people got, get really excited about these kind of technologies and they're like, I'm gonna, you know, put all my photos forever into a folder and then it kind of doesn't slow and they're like, get a bad experience. Obviously, bad thing. Um, that's basically because when I wrote this originally, I was kind of YOLOing pretty hard and um, the way that tree index worked is that it, it just, you know, embeds a list of all uh, entries in a folder in every entry. So it does a linear scan every time. So if you're looking for foo, it'll just look at every entry in the folder and find foo. It's not, it's not really smart. Uh, I also dropped out of school, so maybe that's, <laughs> that's related. Um, but then, you know, it's pretty good, you know, um, development management where you just do things and people yell at you and then you fix them because then you know you're fixing the right things. So, <coughs> Basically, uh, in 10, we're moving uh, to something called a hash try uh, or a hand section and append only hash try we implemented. Uh, uh, this is where I'm gonna get really techno babbly. Um, um, <coughs> so if you don't know hash tries, of course you don't know hash tries. I only learned about them like a, a year ago and now I'm all like, oh, you don't know hash tries. <laughs> um, it's basically a, a really cool uh, data structure. I think IPFS uses hash tries also, right? Yes, exactly. <coughs> really cool. Really cool data structure that allow you to find anything in logarithmic time. For us, it's log four. I'll get to that in a second. But basically, like, if you have a ton of entries, you can very quickly find, uh, given a key value lookup, you can very easily find a, a key, uh, often in, 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 uh, in, in log entries, or in constant time entries, even, often. And it's actually also pretty, uh, it's a pretty new data structure compared to like B trees and stuff. It's, it's super cool. Um, <coughs> so I got super excited when I first learned about this. So I was like, I'm just gonna use DTN to teach people about uh, hash tries uh, while also saying that we're building them to look cool. Uh, so I'm gonna try to explain a little bit, give you a crash code how it works. Maybe you can use it. Um, so basically, you know, the, the problem kind of boils down to this for us. We have some sort of file system thing. We have some sort of, uh, metadata lookup, it could be like a stat call, you know, a read file, whatever, but like, whatever this you're doing, the first thing you do is you have some file name and you wanna find the entry that corresponds to that file name. So, you know, like going back to our metadata log before, obviously the easiest thing is just look at all of them until you find them, uh, but as it's slow, uh, or like do the linear scan we do today, which is also slow. So, um, 
<coughs> the constraint is we only have an append-only log, right? So basically, the only things we can do is uh, append some data. Whenever we append some data, we get a, this opaque identifier that's called sequence number back. That is just like an increasing number, like where the data is stored. And then we can look up the data. And both of these are really fast, right? So don't have to worry about these being slow. These are really, really fast, both of them. But that's our alphabet. That's like the only thing we can work with. Uh, so we want to implement that key values thing on top. <coughs> so that kind of boils down to at some point you want to do an append with an entry that has you know a file name, and we want to write some index that makes this fast. <coughs> so I hope everybody can see this. But basically the trick is you create this try path uh, and try. I think it's pronounced try or tree, but T R I E, not E. -E. So whoever named that should like you know <laughs> not name that. I can't do any good insults in, Dan in English. I can only do them in Danish, otherwise I'm going to sound like an asshole. Um, so basically, the trick is, you know, you, you create this try path where you basically take all the parts of your file name and, you know, you look at the slashes and you just split it ac ac across slash. And then you run each of these parts through a, a hash function. And you want to use a hash function or like an encoding that uses a, a, a small alphabet. Like, you know, a normal alphabet for a hash is, is, you know, a byte. So that's 256 characters. You want to use something way smaller. So for us, and that's just based on trial and error, and, you know, pick your own person. We use base four. So like that's zero, one, two, three uh, characters for each. So you take each of these uh, parts and you hash them through some hash function. That's, that's fast. It actually doesn't have to be secure uh, as long, long as it's fast. Then you get some hash out in the base. So here, you know, I just, put some, some, some um, examples in. Then what you do is you take each of these parts and you, you just add them together and that's like your, that's your path, your try path to this entry. Then what you wanna do, this is the trick, is like you wanna basically just look at your uh, metadata feed where you're pending and then you wanna go uh, back from the latest one and then you wanna find every latest entry in the metadata that shares a prefix when you generate this, this to try for each, each key with, uh, with the one you're appending. So imagine we want to insert number 42 here, and that's the path I had before. So that's like the, the, the try path to that path. Just, I just flipped it around. Uh, and you go, and you know, we scan through the log, and we go back and like at, at item number 39, that was this item. And uh, we basically just compare these two I don't know if you can see why I marked in red now. So this is like the, the shared prefix between the two. And then the trick is, we just remember that, we write a little branch out here where we say, oh, at this point here, there was a, a, a branch uh, where instead of one, the next one, there was two, and it was 39, the branch two. So again, we go through all of them, um, and we find, find every time they do. So for example here, maybe there was another one before us, uh, was 35 where it branched uh, in the beginning, right? <coughs> so uh, there's not going to be that many uh, shared prefixes because it's hashes. So they, you know, it basically just produce a bunch of random noise. It can look like so. Uh, hashes tend to be uniform, so that means they're not going to share much. That's basically what it, that's like fancy math for not sharing much. Um, so and also like for every other prefix. Every other entry that sh uh, has the prefix free one here, that would just be on the 35 if it's before 35. So we don't need to write all of them down. So a little observation here is that since this, our alphabet is only, we only have three characters and we're not considering hash collisions or anything like that, but it's actually pretty easy to make work with hash collisions, but uh, it just makes this a little bit more complicated. Uh, for every entry here, we can only ever have max of, uh, of three branches because our alphabet is only, is only four, right? So it's pretty compact. Um, then in that tree index, the only thing we need to write down in is, these, uh, is these branch pointers. Because that's all the interesting information. I'll tell you a little bit in a second how it actually works when you look it up. So for that example before, the only thing we need to write down if we wanted to append our new item is, 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 is uh, 1135 because there was a branch of position 1 and the branch value was 1 and it pointed to 35. So it's just three numbers. And again, 
there's a branch at four, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, and it's branching to two and it's 39. So hopefully I got that right. Yeah, four, two, 39, right. So we're good, just need to write these numbers down. It's gonna, numbers are really easy to encode. It's not gonna take much space uh, because we need to do this for our every append. So that's really nice. Um, and you can kind of see here, you know, in the worst case, it's not gonna be that much data we're gonna write down. It's pretty compact. And it, since it's hashes, it's gonna not share much. It's, it's always really small, super fast, super efficient. Um, and in practice, you don't need to scan the entire log every time you append. You can do some tricks where you um, very, very easily figure it out using some tricks, but not important things. Programming is all about knowing the tricks. So basically, if you have this kind of index, which is basically what a, a ham is, uh, append only ham is, uh, then if you wanted to find a path, the only thing you need to do is you know take take the target, uh, the path you're looking for, call it a target, and then uh, generate the try path for that target and then uh, you know, save it in a variable and then take the, the latest item in the append only log or whatever item you, know, you wanna look behind from. That's kinda like your version if you think about it that way. Uh, and then the lookup algorithm is as simple as this in pseudocode. <laughs> uh, basically, you have a lookup function where you, know, you pass in the head of your log, like the, the item that is the latest item of your log. And then what you do is you first take your uh, you calculate the shared prefix between the, the target path you're looking for and the try path. And that returns like a, a, sh a shared prefix, um, like an array of these, you know, how, mu how much they share. Then simply the only thing you do is then you just look, is this prefix equal to the node we have right now? If it is, then cool, man, we found it. Awesome, just return it. If it's not, but it's, it's at a branch point, you know, where we're branching out, then just recursively do the lookup, uh, like get the branch node and use that as the head and then do the lookup again. Now we're like way further down to try though, so it's gonna, you know, we're getting closer to the solution. And otherwise we're done. And that's basically how you implement a, a distributed scalable try. So honestly, the code for doing this in practice, you know, you add a bunch of optimizations and stuff like that, but it's not much more complicated than this. And that gives you like that really fast random lookup in distributed systems for key values, which I think is, you know, um, so, uh, like I said, going back to the original premise, this is landing in uh, Hyperdrive 10. Uh, we have it fully working now. Um, I'll show you in the end how you can try it out. Uh, not in a demo, but I'll just give you some links. Uh, it's fully working. Uh, we basically implemented this last year uh, in, uh, in a project we called HyperDB, and then we, we took it out and put it into this. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, super tested. Andrew wrote this amazing fuzzer. So we're testing all these fuzzing examples now. It's so good. I think I had five tests before he came along. So that was, that was pretty nice. Uh, and implemented and ready to go. So <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so it's almost ready to go. It is going to be a breaking change compared to the metadata we have today. So we need to figure out how we roll that out in a nice way. But just FYI. It's much better though. So you should totally get up on board. Uh, here's another problem we had in the previous versions of um, Hyperdrive. Let's check the time. I don't even remember what the time was last time I looked, but it's probably okay. How much time do I have? Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I got time to keep going. Awesome. <laughs> uh, so basically this problem is like, it would be a good slide to stop on though and just like state this problem and leave. <laughs> um, basically we had this problem of like, um, Right now, you know, being one person with a hyperdrive is super cool and easy uh, if you disregard the previous problem, but it's kind of hard to collaborate with hyperdrives. Uh, and also it's kind of hard to like, you know, consume multiple hyperdrives at once and as an entity. Um, we used to usually prefer to uh, refer to this problem as multi-writer. Uh, so like, how do you collaborate with, with uh, hyperdrives? So we have a solution coming out in 10. That's like the start of this. Um, it's called Mounts. Uh, Paul was sending on it a little bit. Uh, mounts is basically just like a file system mount where uh, you can, inside your hyperdrive, you can mount another hyperdrive. Um, so pretty straightforward API, that's what I love about it. It's basically just add this API where you can say, hey, I wanna, on this path here, kind of like, you know, in a, uh, a mount point, I wanna add this, uh, mount this, uh, this uh, other hyperdrive. 
Um, so like just take the hyperdog, pretend it's there. And when you do this, uh, the hyperdrive will actually remember that you did it and, and persist it inside the metadata in a scalable way that means that uh, we should be able to you know, like mount uh, millions of hyper, hi, uh, hyperdrives uh, without any issue. So that's super exciting. Um, and then from inside your mount, uh, you can symlink files outside your own drive. So you can kind of like collaborate that way where you say like, I actually want to pull in this file from this other mount. You can like just write a symlink as you do in the file system. Uh, so that's super cool. Uh, really excited about this. It's, uh, it's a massive iteration on, we've been working on this for a while. As people probably know I get asked about this a lot. Uh, and we've just been making it simpler and simpler, and this is like our simplest iteration yet, and we're really happy with it because it's much more easy to use than all the previous ones we've been through. Uh, it also does less, which is good and bad. Well, I'll get to that. Uh, so we're really, really, really happy with this. Um, so basically, you know, when, once you mount a, a dead, you can then do like, you know, a lookup uh, inside that dead. So, you know, if you mounted something on some path, then when you do a lookup for some path, it basically means you're doing the rest of the lookup on the last, on the dead you mounted. So straightforward, easy to do, uh, and persistent and stuff like that. So you can, you know, this means you can, you could share share a hyperdrive that's basically like a collection of every hyperdrive on Earth. So that's, that's super exciting. Uh, the status on this is that we got this working. Um, I put a little tilde there because um, we're happy with it. It works, but we need to test it more before we tell people to put all their bitcoins in it. Um, so it's pretty okay, but, uh, but, 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 and getting there. Um, right now, this does not support what we call overlapping mounts, which is actually what a lot of people think about when we talk about multi-writer, basically where you're like, you, you know, writing to the same file at the same time and it's crazy and like, who, who gets to win and it's all the CRDT stuff that uh, a lot of protocol lab people are working on and cool shit. Uh, so we actually just decided to punt that because we thought this other thing was so much simpler and easier to use. Uh, but we, we <coughs> we're thinking about uh, re-adding our design for that, but it's going to be later because we just want to get this out. Um, so that's 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 super cool. Um, so my last part, and I'll, I'll go quickly through this because this is the most te technobabbly part of it all, and it doesn't really need to. I was just getting excited when I wrote these slides. Um, so basically. This is my favorite new feature we're adding that nobody knows about because nobody knows this is a problem today. So right now, uh, Hyperdrive is basically like a POSIX file system, but it actually isn't because one thing we do uh, really bad in terms of just file system stuff is we do not handle uh, random access writes very well. We're really good at doing random access reads where you like say, oh, I just want to get this like one byte of this terabyte file. It's awesome, just get that out. It's going to take no time because everything is optimized to do that but we're really bad at uh, random access writes. So if you don't know what I mean by a random access write, it's basically this thing where you're, you know, you're opening a file and you're, and you're writing some data to it. And usually when you write files, you write at the beginning of the file. That's very normal. Uh, but then actually in file systems, you can say like, hey, fuck it, I'm just gonna write it way in the future. Uh, and, and modern file systems, what they do is they don't actually write anything between the previous entry and the new entry. They just have a system where that just works magically. Uh, so, if you ever if you upgraded to uh, the new Apple FS APFS, uh, that's actually one of the big changes that did compared to the old one because the old one was shit at, at this, um, which is was terrible. Um, so we didn't have good support for that, but we're adding that. Uh, why do we want to spend time on this? Uh, because you actually don't really do this in practice. Uh, random access writes is very exotic, uh, but they're really important for completeness. So if you want to have something that actually pretends to be a real file system, you really need this. Uh, and it does mean that uh, you can get, if you have good random access support, you can actually run uh, apps like SQL on top of a virtual file system uh, and MongoDB or like any kind of app. And you can run it in real time, uh, versioned and distributed. So like you can run you know, your, your Mongo cluster that's distributed already with their thing, but then it can also be distributed using the, the hyperdrive stuff. So. That's really exciting for us because that means that we can run any kind of application, uh, but in real time, whereas a lot of times with systems today, you have to like, you know, do a snapshot and then share that snapshot on some P2P network. Here we would just like keep running, assuming the data structures of the, whatever you're using work with that. Uh, which is pretty fun because we actually already have a way to run Hyperdrive on top of LabelDB. So that means you can run Hyperdrive on top of LabelDB that's backed by Hyperdrive itself. So it gets like, oh. <laughs> You say all good like that. It's just gonna. It's like proof of work. If you don't know that, it's like you're just gonna crunch a lot of CPU, boil the ocean a little bit. 
Um, so the way we're doing this, and I'll just skip through it really quickly, is we're adding like an inode inspired design. Uh, so today it works like this. We just have uh, a pointer to some content and a length. So basically when you do a metadata, you get this pointer out and says, hey, my file is stored here and it has 40 blocks. It's just like the next 40 blocks. Very simple, easy, just works, awesome. It doesn't work very well for the random access writes because it means you have to rewrite the entire file every time. Uh, inodes are like a known file system thing that's really cool. It's just a way where the file system just stores this like level of indirection. So instead of storing all the data at once, it stores where you can get the, the data. So it's like, First block is there, but like fourth block, you need to look at this R block and there the data is, and et cetera, et cetera. Really smart, extremely simple. Once I looked this up on Wikipedia, I'm like, what, that's so simple. Smart people, um, in a good way. So we basically implement an append-only version of this uh, that changes hyperdrive to be a free hypercore structure. So we're adding this new one, uh, it's called the inode hypercore. Um, and it basically just works by reusing that try structure I just talked uh, about. So instead of storing hashes in a try, it actually just stores incrementing numbers. And if you do the math, incrementing numbers is actually the best thing you can store in a try because it has perfect distribution. I'm not going to get into that, but that was like I was very surprised by that. I was like, oh, that's weird. But okay, cool. Um, so basically, you just have a function that's like give me a new inode and just increments some increments a number and encodes it in, in the in the base four, and that creates a really, really good try. Like zero and one, and then like you know, keep going. And then um, <coughs> inside this inode, we store an interval tree of writes, which means that you know you just take the writes you've done, and then um, you just compress that down to like you know intervals, like where did you start, where did you end, and combine them together. And then so it kind of looks like this, like a bunch of writes. So that's a really way, easy way to do a bunch of writes. And if this index gets too big, you can split it. And you split it by simply just <laughs> looking at my crazy pseudocode here. Like if it gets too big, you just you just remove it and then you, you go a little bit deeper in the try. Don't try to understand this. I was just like babbling. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand. I'm not even sure it works. <laughs> and you go a little bit deeper and all I should just append to it and it just it's it's clever and smart and, and like it has all other good properties. And you find it the same way. That's also not important. I don't know why I put that in there. Uh, Anyways, so you basically can find them by looking up this, this inode, and uh, once you find it, you can go down this interval tree and you can find them real fast. You just gotta trust me on that. It's just it's really good. Um, so the status of this is we have a ver working version that's only in memory, because that's, that's the cool thing about when you use append-only logs, you can, you can like um, prototype anything using arrays, because it's just an array and an append-only log. So we have, a, we have a working version of this using arrays, but we need to you know, check the design, uh, and our plan is to release this after we got the other two things out. This is gonna be super exciting. Uh, then really quick, we're adding Fuse support, so we're gonna we put a ton, ton of work on getting Fuse to work uh, with Hyperdrive uh, to make it an actual FS. To quick note on Fuse UX, it's terrible. Basically, we require users to go online and download like OS X Fuse or something, and it's like not a good idea, so we spend a ton of time getting that to work uh, in this GitHub org called Fuse Friends, where we basically m make Fuse npm installable as a dependency. So that's super exciting. Um, I'm not gonna dwell into that because I'm a little bit over time. So you can follow the devel development of V10. We have this crazy PR because that was the best way we could figure out how to do it, where we just basically, because we didn't wanna mess up the stable documentation for Hyperdrive, so that's still on the main side. But if you go to this PR, 233, you can follow along, and it's, it's almost, almost always in a working state. We do push uh, 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 to a pre-release tag also that's documented in there, and that's you can try and install it and, and play around with it and give us feedback. It's actually a good time to get involved now because it's getting really close. And that's all I have. Thank you so much. <laughs>